Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bhuvan Mulpalya. Uh, and uh, even I'm from Indian Institute of Technology, Vivek's from Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, it's in Delhi. <coughs> and uh, my uh, course there is Biochemical Engineering and Biotechnology. Right here, uh, I'm working in the Mitchell lab. And they work mostly in bioinformatics area. So, the topic of my presentation today is the effect of RMSD values of structural relatives of on protein flexibility prediction. So, I go through everything one by one. <coughs> so, first of all, I'd like to talk about the big picture, as in where flexibility is involved and where does it come in and why do we need it. So. Most of us know about molecular docking experiments. These experiments uh, are done to see how a particular ligand would interact with the protein in silico. And this is very important in the areas of medicine as well as agriculture, where people look at drug protein interactions and inhibitor studies. So the very first step of any molecular docking experiment would be to classify the protein, as in would be to uh, analyze the protein and what behavior it has. So the first thing that we need to analyze is the protein flexibility and its different conformation analysis. Uh, so protein <coughs> flexibility here, uh, as we as we know that initially a drug, uh, a ligand and a protein interaction was modeled as a lock and key model where a solid ligand would go and interact with a solid protein but then it was changed to an induced fit. There, when a particular ligand interacts with a particular protein, there is some type of conformation change such that uh, the protein best fits the uh, drug. So, induced fit is already uh, always there. So, protein flexibility uh, was required to bring in the induced fit. Now, the problem with including protein flexibility is that any a protein is a very large compound and it has many degrees of freedom. So, allowing it to move freely uh, in space. It requires a lot of computation power. So, I go on to <coughs> the different protein flexibility methods that have been developed till now. So, initially, this started off with soft docking, which uh, this method is a very easy and efficient way uh, of including flexibility, where uh, they allow a, a certain overlap between the ligand and protein. After that. Uh, people started to include side chain flexibility where the side chains were allowed to move somewhat. Now both of these methods are easy uh, as in the computations are, computations are efficient uh, and implementation is easy. But the disadvantage, both of them, uh, the main disadvantage is that they can account only for small conformation changes and backbone flexibility isn't there. So people came up with another method called molecular relaxation where a ligand and a protein both are considered rigid first and they are allowed to dock and after that the binding pocket it is allowed to move a bit such that there is some kind of relaxation. So it has a, a backbone flexibility included in it and uh, but the problem here is that again this demands a lot of computation power. After this uh, people started using uh, docking of multiple protein structures. Here, uh, what they do is they use an unbounded <coughs> protein structures such so that they can include somehow many different conformations of the protein. So, definitely backbone flexibility is included uh, in this and calculations are easier and faster. So, my work here, uh, what I had to do was uh, we have a script that predicts protein flexibility. So that requires different models of a particular protein. So those models are created using structural relatives. I have to uh, see what RMSD range of th those structural relatives would best predict flexibility. So RMSD is root mean square deviation and it tells us how much one structure would deviate from another one. So I was given a list of 28 proteins for which I had to see which range of RMSD would best uh, you know, predict flexibility. So out of these, around 20 were rigid and 8 were more flexible. And so the method that I use is, first I search for proteins having similar structure, then uh, I select proteins in a particular RMSD range, then uh, I use a program called Modeler, 
to make around 20 models. <coughs> After that, uh, the, these models are used to find out the flexible regions. And then this is compared against observed flexibility uh, and then scored. So searching for our similar proteins, uh, this is a snapshot. Uh, of an uh, online, uh, online available software called DALI. What DALI does is it does a multiple structural alignment of uh, a particular protein, which, whichever one you want, you can input that, you can input the PDB ID, and it gives out the list of many different proteins uh, with different information such as the RMSD range right there, then the alignment length, uh, then the number of residues, and the percentage identity. Now, this list is not complete, there, there, there may be around 800 to 1000 proteins in the list. So, once I select certain proteins in a particular RMSD range, uh, DALI allows for multiple structural alignment. So, I can align all of the structures together and get this kind of an alignment. Now, once I have this alignment in my hand, I download all the PDB structures of all those proteins that I have chosen and I feed the alignment as well as uh, as well as the PDB structures into the program called Modeler. Now what Modeler does is, uh, it, uh, it does homology modeling. That is, it would take a chain, uh, it, uh, it would use it as a template and it would kind of thread the protein that we want to model o over that chain and predict a structure. So, this modeling is, is done by satisfaction of different spatial restraints such as uh, bond lines, bond angles, dihedral angles and non bond uh, atom atom contacts. So, I get around 20 models. So, at first sight, these look all this, uh, like they look almost the same. But if you see closely, there are certain changes in the loops right here. So, these can be viewed as flexibility in this particular protein. So this would be more clear if I play all of these frame by frame. So <coughs> on the left, uh, the protein that's playing on the left, you can clearly see that on the left it's less flexible and on the right it's more flexible. So we get this by using different RMSD ranges. So it's clear if we use a smaller RMSD range, we get a Kind of a, uh, we, we, we get less flexibility, but if we use a larger RMSD range, we get more flexibility in the same protein. So after that, we take out the flexible regions. So this is, uh, and once we have the flexible regions from the models, we compare it uh, with regions found by using unbound and bound proteins. So every protein that we have in our list has a bound structure as well as an unbound structure. So this can be the bound structure and this bound to the ligand and this is the unbound structure. So you can see the green part would be considered as flexible. So on the basis and then uh, this is say our structure and the green parts are the flexible. So we compare th uh, these green part parts with the green parts in the bound and unbound from and on the basis of how good the predictions are, uh, we would set the RMSD range for selecting the protein. So the comparisons uh, are done somewhat like this, where say this is the observed flexibility and this is the predicted one. So any overlap between the flexible areas would be awarded and any missing residues, <coughs> such as this part, this part is missed right here and any extra uh, residues that have been predicted would get a negative score. And the penalty curves are somewhat like this, as in the penalty increases as we uh, as the number of residues which are predicted extra or are missed increase. Uh, and there is a higher penalty for predicting an area with no flexible region. This is because or if a particular area is missed. This is because we want to predict almost all of it and we'd like to rather predict more than lose out on a flexible part. So, once all of this was done, uh, this is a normal plot where I plotted the RMSD range right here and this is the number of, uh, this is just a number and first, second, third year is the first best prediction, the second best prediction and the third best prediction. 
So at first sight, we can see for rigid proteins, 0 to 1 range is kind of the best and 0 to 2 is the second best, where these have predicted the best structures, best flexibility. For flexible proteins, it's a bit more uh, loose because uh, the RMSD range can go up to 0 to 4 and that is kind of intuitive. If we increase the RMSD uh, range, the protein would be more flexible. So, what we did was we normalized the scores and I plotted uh, all of uh, the average score a particular RMSD value would give against uh, so against the RMSD range. So the scores here are relative to each other, so the absolute values uh, make little sense. So we can see that a very high RMSD range such as 5 to 6 would uh, predict uh, that the whole protein is flexible and very loose. So <coughs> If we take all the proteins in total, we'd see uh, a lower RMSD range, may say 0 to 1, 0 to 3, would be the best way to go about in predicting flexibility. <coughs> and if we seg uh, segregate rigid and flexible out, again we have a similar kind of result where 0 to 1 and 0 to 2 is best for rigid, and uh, till about 0 to 3. Uh, to 0 to 4, <coughs> flexible proteins can be predicted. So, first of all, uh, I'd like to tell you a point that when we are predicting flexibility, we do not know beforehand whether a particular protein is flexible or is uh, rigid. So, we wanted some, some kind of a range which can work for both. So, ultimately, as we can see, a lower RMSD range kind of predicts better for both of them. So I would say that the low RMSD range would be the best to uh, predict uh, flexibility. Apart from that, observed flexibility is dependent on the bound and unbound structures. So the observed flexibility that we use to compare our results with uh, directly depends on the structures, the experimental structures that we had. So if there is a transitionary flexibility in the protein, uh, which, have not, which has not been captured in the structures, we would miss out on that. That's why, again, we would like to predict extra flexibility rather than miss out on something. <coughs> and while doing these experiments, uh, there are a number of variable factors that are involved, such as the number of PDPs used as an input to modeler, the sequence alignment and the sequence identity. So it would be interesting to see how the results would change if probably smaller ranges are used the next time and if other factors are kept constant on a particular range and then change the RMSD value. So finally, uh, I would like to acknowledge Professor Julie Mitchell, who <laughs> thank you for hosting me in her lab, Dr. Gary Resenberg, who actually helped me out with all of my scripts and everything, <laughs> Amanda Boyan, who's my uh, guide, and all my fellow lab mates for helping me out, the Corona program, and the funding uh, Department of Biotechnology India, University of Wisconsin, and IUS SPF. If you have any questions, I think. I hate to be the one asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can see Kent just lower his head with his hands. <laughs> Um, it's really exciting these days, you know, to use unstructured regions and start predicting function for that, right? Uh, until recently, <coughs> people had been unappreciative, one might argue, of unstructured pests, but now it's become apparent that this is the sort of thing that people are trying to target drugs and things like that. Fold when they bind partners, choose between partners, etc. Can you begin to predict something like that? So that? This is a region that is flexible. Not only does it allow proteins to move, but might also be a scaffold for these types of interactions or these types of chelation of metals perhaps or something like that? Definitely, definitely. This can be uh, used in that area as well. Because uh, when we talk about chelation and any other interaction, ultimately we are talking about two things interacting with each other. And this flexibility that I, uh, I am working on, this would ultimately be used on molecular docking experiments where, two, uh, where we have two molecules which are interacting with each other. Do you need prior knowledge or could you now go back and use things like Folded, the program that sort of people have been using quite effectively 
to predict second destruction and parts that they can't quite predict then go in and Yeah, that's the whole point. <coughs> that's, uh, as in we, do, that's why we predict things. Because if we do not have prior knowledge, this would be the best way to go about it. If we know something has a particular probability of predicting, uh, say it has a probability of 0.8 of predicting a good structure, then why not use it?